even if the most ideal conditions that we are able to separate the state and the church, uh -huh. we will always be subconsciously affected, as um, Ms. David said, affected by the fundamentalism that we have in the religion, religious aspect or in the, in the religion as a social institution. But my question is, how do we demarcate mere educating these women on, for example, reproductive health without meddling with their right to exercise religious beliefs? Um, for example, to be quite um, for, to be quite con concrete, we have the uh, we have heard of the genital mut mutilation in some parts in Asia. Some women go against um, the organizations or the international organizations' efforts to help them out of that oppression. But they go against it because it is part of their culture, of their beliefs, of their norms. When do we demarcate? When we, we are just getting in to educate them. And when do we say that we are actually crossing the line and interrupting or doing something about their religious beliefs? Um, yes. Did that do anything? Yes. <laughs> Let me take it. I asked for it because it is actually part of my paper, no? mm -hmm. uh, two things. First, the freedom to believe whatever you like, like, which is the freedom of religious belief, is different from the freedom to express that belief. Mm -hmm. The right to believe in anything is absolute, perhaps. It's part of your privacy. But there must be limitations in the right to expressing that belief. OK, so that's the first premise. The second, therefore, is we need to ask whether these women who are suffering from female genital mutilation really want to. Very often, it is an imposition of your, their culture, and if you mm -hmm. ask them, they will. Okay. Third is, I say it's related to my paper because it goes to the question of how we interpret secularism. Mm -hmm. As I said in the paper, Secularism isn't the complete separation of moral, ethical, religious discussions from the formation of state policy. In fact, we can accept that, but it needs to be in a context of democratic um, discussion with the protection of the rights of the minority. So we cannot completely separate, but we can put up the parameters necessary mm -hmm. so that social policy does is affected by moral decision making because as feminists we cannot be hypocritical. We do want our moral values to be part of the formulation of social policy. And of course, third, the entire question is whether or not you believe in that great document called the Declaration of Human Rights and the subsequent documents in the development of human rights discourse because it is clear in the statements of the United Nations, the sexual and reproductive health and rights are part of the great number of rights that we must enjoy cross-culturally. And that includes questions you've referred to. It is also clear in declarations such as the Declaration on the Elimination of Violence Against Women by the UN General Assembly that genital mutilation and other forms of religious and culturally based forms of violence against women are unacceptable across cultures. So I think, you know, that's the question. I don't find it difficult theoretically, you know, but it is in fact a question of the women's movement and women's power, whether we're able to achieve that kind of secularism. Okay, thank you. Thank I you. hope you're happy. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Can, shall we take another question from the floor before we go to Yupi Los Baños? I understand Yupi Los Baños is ready. Okay, so uh, I don't see anybody raising his or her hand, so let's go to UP Los Baños. UP Los Baños, come in, please. Yes, 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 yes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, colleagues. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I am uh, Emmy Mendoza from the Department of Social Development Services. College of UN Ecology. 
and uh, our question from our end is uh, addressed to Dr. Sobicheya. Aside from conducting research with a feminist perspective and engaging in intellectual discourses, what concrete ways and practical means can be initiated and done within the university to ensure the accountability of the state towards the respect, protection, promotion, or fulfillment of the rights of women and other marginalized groups. That's it. Uh, I hope I got a question correctly. She's asking about what the university can do yes. uh, in line with the discussion. I'm proud to say that UP has done a lot. We have done most of the studies. Uh, we, UP, UPPI has done over the years studies on adolescent fertility that have been used for policy development. We, we contribute to the review of bills, to the craft, crafting of bills, College of Law. Our vice president is here. Uh, but I, the, I guess we have to work some more, uh, do some more studies that can be used for legislation, as basis for legislation. The most immediate thing that we have to do is to get a law passed on reproductive health so that government will finance uh, reproductive health uh, clinics, services all over the country to benefit the poor. Uh, I, this is, to me, the most immediate thing, and I think scholars, researchers, teachers from the University of the Philippines and other universities must work together to get this done. Uh, this is my answer to the question. We're doing a lot of training as well. We do training for legislators on how to craft bills. We do advocacy, a lot of advocacy work. All the centers, gender studies programs, and all the constituent campuses have done their share towards advocacy for ordinances and policies to promote women's human rights. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sobricea, and thank you to UP Los Baños, uh, Professor Emelinda Mendoza there. Uh, do we have any question from the floor? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, Vice President uh, Marvik Leonin. My, my name is Marvik. I belong to the College of Law of the Philippines, found in the university. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, first, the Constitution is quite weird uh, because it was mentioned a while ago. The phrase actually says, the state shall protect, uh, shall equally protect the rights of women and the unborn from conception. There's something ungrammatical about it, but I think that there is enough jurisprudence to support the idea that it can be interpreted in so many ways, such as when does con conception actually start? And I think this was one of the contentious points in one case that was raised. Um, and second, the, the dichotomy between opinion and expression is something that is even contested already uh, in jurisprudence. Can you really separate religious belief or is every form of religious belief already an act in itself and therefore part of worship? So in this context, I have two questions. The first one is, well, can you consider law as a fundamentalism? Because looking at all your elements <laughs> and looking at my, my discipline, I found it to have a, a, a very uncomfortable fit with your concept of a fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. And my second question is, is our difficulty in accepting uh, the current president's actions stemming from a presumption that only men can support a patri patriarchy, that there are also women that support a patriarchy. Definitely. <laughs> May I answer the first? I think laws, when they are undemocratically passed, can be a form of fundamentalism. But we can craft laws. You are the lawyer. I'm not the lawyer. I'm an anthropologist. But with a very participatory and enabling crafting of law, we can, we can have a law that can, that can represent the opinion and the views, the context, and the locations of individuals, I think. It is when laws are done by UP professors 
and <laughs> alone without consultation and they're passed without uh, again consultation in Congress that it's when it becomes very fundamentalist um, I'm going to do a really nerdic academic oh I'm sorry go ahead yes go ahead. Just, just to add to that I think it is important how um, the law is I mean, the law, I think, is also a tool that can be used in, in different ways. And, um, for example, we had the, the recent, um, or not too long ago, we had the example of French secularism use the law to define French secularism in a particular way. The use of the law to prevent Muslim women from wearing the hijab to school. Um, that was an example of the secular French state using the law to, I think, uh, very narrowly define French secularism to represent a particular cultural majority. So uh, I think, yes, I, I, I think that that is something that we have to be very careful about in terms of how legislation, the process of legislation, and how it can be used either way. I'm, I'm going to do a nerdy thing by promising to forward to Marvik an article by Karima, Karima Benoon that I found in the Stanford Law Journal of 2006 on the issue of wearing the veil legislation and that dichotomy of freedom of religious belief and expression. It would be interesting if I took six hours, but we only have a few. Um, because she says that the application of the law in terms of veiling, and she looks at um, she looks at the French law, I think she looks at one in Algeria, can always be contextualized by the courts in order to uphold human rights principles. So, for example, here, if we outlaw veiling in UP, it may be wrong. No? But, for example, I think it was in Egypt and in, in, the French, in a French school where the, the feminists who fought actually were able to prove that this veiling was a signal for much greater intolerance, that there was already violence on the campus resulting from women not wearing the veil, that the jurisprudence was the other way around. The concrete example shows you that law can either be fundamentalist if it's crafted by other schools, not UP, but... Um, <laughs> can be quite accepting of diversity if it is crafted by secular universities like the University of the Philippines. I think Ambassador Manalo wants to give a reaction. No, I, I think there was a question raised by the gentleman, the very lovely gentleman over there as to that there are some women who do not uh, wish to be in the feminist movement. Of course, there are, just as there are some in the patriarchy who do not wish to be with the patriarchy but favor with the feminist movement, I mean the gentlemen. Well, I would just say that with respect to the women who do not wish to join the, uh, the feminist movement, that's freedom of choice if they don't want to. Maybe it's because they find themselves comfortable enough to be what they are. Maybe some of them are masochistic and they enjoy that. <laughs> Or maybe they're not enlightened enough and need a little more education, but whatever it be, that's her choice, so we respect it. Okay, shall we leave that one? I think Iloilo is ready. Shall we have Iloilo? Iloilo, come in. Good afternoon, this is Professor Mary Louise Libreno, your moderator for UP Visayas. We have a question here from Professor Rosario Aslo of the Division of Humanities. I would like to address this question to Carol, but first of all, I would like to congratulate all of you for very well researched papers and very thought-provoking ideas. The question is more basic. Uh, how do we reconcile the issue of fundamentalism with the issue of feminization of poverty? The latter being a more urgent issue that confronts many of our women according to many of us in the audience. Addressing this to Dr. Sobseya. 